Good morning, church, and welcome to Good Shepherd. My name is David Gunger. I'm going to lead us in this call to worship. This is the fifth step in our Lenten journey, the step of sacrifice. Be with us, O Lord, as we take this step. This requires the willingness to give all of your life to the Lord. Be with us, Lord, as we commit our lives to you. Come, let us worship and offer our voices of praise to God. Let us open our hearts and our spirits to God this day. Amen. Let us sing together. This is my Father's world, and to
And now a reading from Psalm 92. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name. O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, Lord. I sing for joy at what your hands have done. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still here bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. You shall cross the barren desert But you shall not die of thirst You 
You shall wander far in safety Though you do not know the way You shall speak your words to foreign lands And they will understand You shall see the face of God and live Be not afraid I go before you always Come follow me And I If you pass through raging waters In the sea you shall not drown If you walk amid the burning flames You shall not be hung If you stand before the power of hell and death is at your side Know that I am with you through it all Be not afraid I go before you Blessed are your poor For the kingdom shall be theirs Blessed are you that weep and mourn For one day you shall laugh And if wicked men insult and hate you all because of me Blessed Blessed are you Be not afraid I go All are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. For Christ brings peace to all. Tearing down every hostile wall. So that the many may become one. One heart. One family. One new humanity. For God, who is love. And Christ, who is all and in all. Show no partiality and make no distinction. So neither race nor class, gender nor sexuality, politics nor religion, personality nor nationality, count for us or against us. The light of Christ enlightens all. Christ the prisoner and the naked. Christ the hungry and the sick. Christ the thirsty and the stranger. Christ the other. May God's spirit hover over our chaos. Our hatred and our indifference. Descend in our hearts with love and pleasure. Blow us out into the world to listen and to serve. And set us ablaze to forgive and reconcile. 
for all are welcome at the table of God. Every human is God's child. Black day, stormy night No love, no hope in sight Don't cry, he is coming Don't die without knowing The cross Someday war will be a memory in a city with no end. Till then, I am still running for the light. I'm all peace on the outside and fury within. Oh, Lord, I am still running. 
for the light And all the times I turn away When things are going well And all the times I need you When I cannot help myself Your open arms, they greet me When I come crawling back again Oh Lord, I am still running for the light I rise and fall like a wounded dove There's still peace and hope There's still joy and love Hard times lead to harder And the road has many tears Oh Lord, I am still running for the light a song that will linger on forever in my ears Oh Lord, I am still running for the light In vain I try to hold on to the things I can't control Like what if something happens to the ones I love Take away my fears Oh Lord I am still running For the light Oh Lord I am still running For the light Oh Lord I am still running For the light Hi, my name is Kelly, and I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Please join us in our generosity prayer. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world, and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. May this be true of our community. Amen. At this time, we invite you to share the gift of your blessing by simply saying grace and peace with those watching with you now, or by texting or calling a loved one. Grace and peace to you. Hi, my name is Kyle Westaway, and I have been a part of the Good Shepherd community for over a decade. In fact, I was there at uh, the first service we ever had uh, over a decade ago, and uh, I happen to be a member of the Board of Trustees as well. Good Shepherd has been uh, such an amazing place for me. Um, over the last decade, there's been a lot of life changes for me, but that this has been a consistent community for two things, both like personal spiritual growth, a place for me to um, to grow, a context in which for me to grow personally. Secondly, um, just uh, family, building family um, within the church. A lot of my best friends have come out of this community and are, are like family to me. And as I've, uh, uh, as I've gotten married and have two kids now, 
I think about it as as the future of, uh, of my new family. And uh, I, I, both of our sons have been dedicated uh, at Good Shepherd. So we're excited about the future of Good Shepherd. And, you know, we're in a moment of transition right now. And um, there's a lot of probably uncertainty, there's a, that which comes with a little bit of fear and uncomfortableness. I'm just reminded that in the life of our church, we've gone through a number of different shifts uh, of venue. We started at 75 Murray, we were there for a number of years until that ended. And then we were at the middle school for a number of years and then at GTS. We've also gone through, uh, we were originally a part of a family of churches, a network of churches here in New York, and we've gone out on our own. So those are some pretty big transitions. What I'll say is Christ has been our good shepherd through that whole process, has been guiding us, and I think bringing us to a, a deeper and deeper place each time. So I'm confident that as we go through this transition in venue, that um, God will be doing something great with us in that, in that uh, transition. Uh, we're also excited as a family to be contributing to the transition fund to make sure that um, we can build the next stage, the next chapter of Good Shepherd together. Hello, we're Tom and Jennifer from Maine. Hope for us is like oxygen, and as 2020 groaned on, we found ourselves depleted. Between slowly walking away from a faith system that had held us for nearly three decades and current events, we had hit a low. And then we met Good Shepherd New York and took a deep, restorative breath. The first time we attended Digital Church was when we were on our way to a main hike, and we pulled over and wept because we were so moved by the, the service. We eagerly joined digital small groups and found ourselves surrounded by brilliant young people the ages of our adult children and found healing there we didn't know we needed. We've also joined the East Coastish small group and developed meaningful friendships. We remain so grateful for a place that invites intellectual curiosity. And so between Michael's thoughtful and powerful messages, the world-class music led by David Gunger and Kate's thoughtful and kind way of guiding us spiritually. It's just a tremendous opportunity for us. We know that the pandemic has been terrible, but we're so grateful that it birthed Digital Church and an opportunity for people like us to be with all of you. We look forward to the opportunity to share in what is coming for the future of, great, of Good Shepherd and especially our Good Shepherd, New York. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Good morning, welcome to Good Shepherd, New York. My name is Michael Rizzina and I'm one of the pastors here. Today our reading is from the Gospel according to St. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. And those for who uh, they hate their life in this world, keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it, and they said that it was thunder, and others said that an angel has spoken to him. But Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I and lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, 
Lord Jesus Christ. Well, at this time, I invite you to a moment of quiet, having reflected on read our gospel reading. Now we open our hearts to God and to our own experiences that we bring into this moment, and we ask God to meet us through this story for the sake of our world and our own growth. Let us hold this moment of quiet together. God, we pray for your help. We pray that you would stir our imaginations and that somehow that would alter the way that we live and it would translate as good news, not only for us, but for our world. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, here we have probably one of the most profound offerings by Jesus of the meaning of his own death. Here, Jesus offers definitively the power of his own execution and what it means not only to him, but for human history. And this insight into meaning, this offering of an interpretation of the cross begins with his own trouble. He has this moment of existential dread and terror as he considers what lies ahead. And this is incited by, of course, the attention coming from the Greeks through the disciples to himself. And here Jesus realizes that he is on the precipice of glory, and yet his soul is troubled. Jesus says, and now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? I find it interesting to start from this place of trouble, especially on the fifth Sunday of Lent. We all face troubles, troubles in our world, troubles in our individual lives. We face collective troubles in the smaller communities to which we belong. And it's often this place of trouble that can distill for us and unlock for us new understandings and deeper insight into the very meaning of our lives. We look at the world right now and its conflicts and wars, and I don't know about you, but it continues despite uh, my persistent sort of staying abreast on the news and the information and the stories coming out, despite my own prayers for these situations, despite, uh, you know, even my attempts at generosity and um, trying to advocate for things that I think matter and are important, I still find myself overwhelmed and also at a loss for what to say or what to do. And I can honestly say with Jesus, as I survey the situation in Gaza, as I survey the situation that continues in Ukraine and other parts around the world that often get less attention because of you know, the United States interests, my soul is troubled. And what we do in the face of that trouble matters. How we respond truly matters. I also think of individual troubles, the personal stresses and burdens that I carry, that you carry. It's often a deep and profound uh, weight that we shoulder. And I'm aware of these, partly because of my role within this community. I, I hear when you're sick or when loved ones are sick. I hear when you're about to give birth or are, you know, asking for prayer around a transition or a financial stress or uh, a conflict that feels like it's shadowing your entire life. And these burdens, which I know we carry as individuals, uh, also uh, amount to collective burdens. I think of the circumstances of our particular church community and how we received the terrible news on the Monday before Ash Wednesday that this beautiful place which we've called home since 2020 at General Theological Seminary will no longer be available to us and that we're having to find a new venue and that those of us who live here uh, in this place are having to find new housing. And I think of the stress that that involves, the sense of our souls being troubled as we face these challenges. And yet the good news of this story is good news for our story that even in the midst of our deepest trouble, where our soul feels shaken by our circumstances, these are the moments of illumination. These are the moments where the meaning of our lives can be distilled and we can sift away 
uh, or sift through the clutter and the things that get in the, in the way or distracting to what really matters. And Jesus has a moment of clarity in this moment of trouble. He says, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? This is the prayer which reflects the sort of instinct of the axis of power to self-preserve. It's what we often do in all of our trouble, you know, political, national, uh, inter, uh, geopolitical, and then also internally when we're facing the challenges and the conflicts of our lives. We want to self-preserve, and our prayer life, our spirituality can reflect that. But Jesus consciously and intentionally says no to that approach. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It's for this hour that I've come. What replaces that vision of self-preservation, that impulse to say, save me from this particular trial? It's a different impulse. And Jesus puts it into this phrase, Father, glorify your name. Now, this is a fascinating theme throughout the entire Bible, this idea of God's glory and humanity reaching its full potential, reach, reaching its purpose in uh, creation through participating in that glory of God. But that can also feel like an egotistical project. I mean, when we think about glory in the human realm or glory uh, in a personal way, we often critique it. Uh, of course, we're drawn to it, but we also see the shadow of it, especially in others. And we often wonder, why is this bad for God uh, if it's bad why is it not bad for God if it's bad for us? The reality is that Jesus is revealing to us this God who is unconditional love, this powerful God who becomes vulnerable in the face of human violence and power preservation. This is the God that we're dealing with. This is the glory that we're dealing with. And the cross unlocks a new dimension, a new window into this glory that had previously been misunderstood or overlooked for most of history. This glory, this name, this reputation is something that is truly good news, not only for our world, but for our individual lives. And so in this moment of trouble where Jesus' soul is shaken, he makes a choice to step away from the instinct to self-preserve. And he enters into something bigger that will certainly require sacrifice, but will enable him to connect with the larger meaning of the entire universe, the glory of God's unconditional love and beauty. This involves sacrifice to be sure, and you know, the book of Hebrews has ways of talking about Jesus' sacrifice that are perplexing. Uh, we often look at sacrifice or as trouble, uh, at trouble as a threat to be avoided or to be protected from. But Jesus here in this moment sees the cross as something to be endured with joy. The author of the book of Hebrews reflects on Jesus' death and says that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, which is a beautiful mystery on this fifth Sunday of Lent for us, that there are dimensions to joy that cannot be unlocked except through this experience of sacrificial love. Jesus, in the face of his trouble, willingly embraces sacrificial love. And then he knows, as a byproduct of that, a joy that very few of us touch in our lives. I think that the meaning Jesus gives to his death here is profound, and I want to think of it through the three headings that he gives. First of all, it is a judgment of this world. Second, it is an exorcism of this world and the ruler of this world. And then third, it is a drawing together of all humanity. First, the judgment. Jesus uh, in, thinks of his own death and his impending execution as a judgment on this world. We live in the world of Cain. This is the world, uh, of course, uh, that is instituted and founded by violence and accusation in order to preserve power. That was Cain's first original murder. Uh, he kills his brother Abel out of envy and rivalry, and it begins a cycle. It truly begins a civilization as he moves on to build a city himself, a civilization that endures to today, a cycle, a culture, a way of being that endures to today. And the power of this cycle is that it often goes unquestioned, unresisted, unnamed. And what Jesus does on the cross 
is exposes this instinct to power, this way of managing through accusation and violence for what it is. He labels this axis of power rooted in accusation and violence as evil. He judges it. And he does this in the most provocative and paradoxical way. He does it through the vulnerability of state execution. You know, the, the literal crucifixion of Christ involved Jesus being stripped down to a place of nakedness. And this is something that religious art has really struggled to depict. Uh, we, we are very hesitant to portray Jesus in that full vulnerability that he experienced. And yet everyone who was crucified was stripped down to complete nakedness, made completely vulnerable and exposed, shamed publicly. And what Christian leaders and uh, theology has said over time is that the cross paradoxically exposes the world. It strips the world down to what it really is. It shames the world in its use of power and violence and accusation. And Jesus holds a mirror up to us in the cross, showing us the failure and the evil of our own instincts. This is difficult to see. It's often extremely difficult to see in ourselves or in the groups that we belong to. It's typically easier to see in other people or in other groups. But this axis of power that is enforced by violence and acquired through accusation reigns. And it reigns as something perceived as good. Because usually when we come up against conflict or when our power is threatened or our stability is threatened, the use of accusation and violence can bring great stability. It can, be, uh, it can bring great order. It can bring even great beauty into our lives. And this is why it's often seen as redemptive. And uh, through our storytelling and through our anthems, through our memorials and through uh, our history telling, we basically build up and heroize this reigning way of the world. You know, what we look to as noble and having dignity and righteousness, Jesus exposes on the cross as bankrupt. The two figures representing the powers that crucified Jesus, Caiaphas, the religious power, and Pontius Pilate, the political power, are weighed in the balance on the cross, and they're found to be wanting. And it is a judgment on all the ways that our religious and political power are exerted and used in the vein of self-preservation. And the way that they participate and come together to bring the force of accusation and the force of violence into our world to solve our problems. And Jesus says, essentially, this is not the way. That there is a new way, that there is another way that's possible. Uh, not, not an axis of power enforced by violence and accusation, but an axis of love enforced or expressed through forgiveness and reconciliation. So Jesus judges the world on the cross. And you know, we judge those who judge to Jesus in that way, but we fail often to see how we're complicit and how we participate in this accusation impulse and our impulse to violence. And I think on this fifth Sunday of Lent, we're meant to reckon with the ways we run so quickly, both to accusation and violence, to protect our power. Jesus is showing us that it's bankrupt, showing us that it only continues the cycle of violence, and that ultimately we need to put our trust, put our faith, put our hope in a different way. The second thing Jesus says is that through the cross, he drives out the ruler of this world. And this is a fascinating phrase used over and over in John's Gospel. One of the things that, Jesus, uh, that John says three times is in sh chapter 12, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. In chapter 14, the ruler of this world is coming and he has no power over me. And then in chapter 16, the ruler of this world has been condemned. Now this one who Jesus calls the ruler of this world is the one who Paul calls the God of this world. Paul says, speaking of those uh, who are uh, using power in the form of darkness, he says, in their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds to keep them from seeing the light of Christ, who is the image of God, end quote. The ruler of this world, the God of this world, is one who's clearly identified throughout the Bible as the Satan, the accuser, the deceiver. And Jesus said, when he's lifted up in crucifixion, 
that the Satan, the ruler, the God of this world, is driven out. Now, that term driven out is used over 30 times in the Gospels, and in each case it's used to talk about Jesus' power over those afflicting forces in people's lives. Now, how do we understand the ruler of this world, God of this world, this satanic influence? I think Brian Zahn, in his book, The Wood Between the Worlds, A Poetic Theology of the Cross, puts it very helpfully in this way. Quote, probably the best understanding of the Satan is as an enormously complex spiritual psychic phenomenon of accusation that leads to organized violence, end quote. This is, in his words, more than a metaphor, but less than an individual person. The Satan is a sort of phenomenon of accusation and violence in our imagination and in our systems and our collective action. It is the violence that rules the world and that has won over our imaginations when it comes to the conflicts and how we solve our problems. It's a phenomenon that reigns because it is rarely seen for what it is, as evil. And in the words of St. Paul, the God of this world has blinded our minds. If we use that image from Homer's Odyssey, the siren song, and we consider the siren song of the Satan, it would be a deadly orbit around an axis of power enforced by violence. The blindness exists because we almost never see this for what it is, right? We conflate accusation and violence and we heroize it. We see that it brings order. We see that it brings stability. We see that it brings security, that it helps us to govern. We see honor and courage and order that the violence brings to our society. But we often fail to see the innocent blood that is shed, and there's always innocent blood that's shed. We fail to see the ways that our violence begets more violence, that our violent response, even in retribution, even with a sense of justice, is always creating the seeds of a force that will come back upon us. The accusations that violence makes through, as essentially it becomes sacred in our imaginations through myths and anthems, memorials, monuments, holidays, history books. And this is how Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, according to St. Paul. There are two uh, art pieces uh, from uh, the 1800s that depict this contrast. First, you see this uh, painting called American Progress by John Gast, where the expansion of uh, the American project in North America uh, is represented by the goddess Columbia, this figure of justice and power of light, shining a light as it moves west. Behind her, the infrastructure of railroad and the power of cowboys and horses and that sort of westward expansion uh, perceived as full of dignity and full of meaning and beauty. And what's being driven out or driven away in the darkness under cloud are the buffalo and the indigenous people. This is a way in which we often cast uh, and experience a blindness to our own accusation and violence, and we call it dignified, and we call it meaningful, and we call it righteous. This happens over and over in our imagination. But there's another art piece of artwork from the same period called The Two Crowns by Sir Frank Dixie. And here, we see the vestige of power represented through a king who is in the full uh, regality of armor, war armor, who rides on a war horse, who is in the midst of a parade and the pomp and circumstance of homage and reverence from his people. And in this moment of glory, right, the glory that we often call good, that brings stability and order and guides our lives, it justifies the impulse to violence and accusation. This scene of glory is called into question when we behold the face of this king. The king is preoccupied with a vision of another crown, the crucifixion of Christ. And we see in his face uh, an ambiguity, even perhaps a horror. He looks up to this other crown, to this other way, 
He looks from his place of strength and protection, of military might, up to the vulnerability of the crucified Christ. And the entire system, the entire structure, all the propaganda, all that supports it, that makes it feel righteous, is called into question. And this is the work of the cross. The cross shames the pretentious propaganda of our power and uh, the empires that we create. It disseminates uh, a different news and a different perspective. And during Lent, if we sit long enough with Christ who's crucified, we become the place from which the God of this world is driven out and exposed. This is the exorcism that we need, not only for the wars of our world to think differently and use our imagination to think creatively about ways to get under the surface of what's causing these problems, to start to build bridges of reconciliation and dialogue and to restrain and see our impulse to violence for what it is. But also, there is a need for this third meaning, which Jesus lays out for us, which is a drawing of the world to himself. There is a powerful invitation that goes far and wide at the crucifixion, and it's the invitation of God's vulnerable love. God meets our instinct to protect our power through accusation and violence with an axis of love that's expressed through forgiveness and reconciliation. And when Jesus dies on the cross, he is refounding this world on that new axis. And Lent is about reorienting our lives around that axis of love, of consciously choosing to, to shift from the axis of power, the instincts to violence and accusation, into the axis of love that expresses through forgiveness and peace. The result is that Jesus draws all people to himself. There is a drawing power to this love. There is an attractive quality to it. It can look to the one who is downtrodden and beaten down and brutalized and lift them up. It can look to the one who does that evil work and it can restore and heal and call them to a different way. Jesus' table did this. Jesus' life did this. The cross does this. And now the witness of the church, in as much as it reflects the beauty and the power of the cross, continues to do it today. During Lent, we're called to become a people who reorient our lives around the God we see in the crucifixion and to bear witness to that drawing of all humanity to God. The Psalms say over and over, God's love endures forever. And while we know from human history that human beings can and effectively do resist this love in all the ways that bring the horror of our lives and the conflicts of our lives, we also know the beauty and the hope of those individuals who look to Jesus' crucifixion and are unlocked and they enter into that dimension of joy that is released through suffering love and sacrifice and they themselves bear witness to another world possible. I think as a community, we are meant to reflect on this ourselves. For our own lives, what sacrificial love is God calling us into to choose rather than the self-preservational, sort of accusational and violent ways that we typically choose? Yeah. In religious life, as a religious community, as we face displacement and look to a new future, what does it mean to unlock the joy of sacrifice through prayer and through storytelling and through giving? in our own interpersonal conflicts? What does it look like to choose the expression of forgiveness and the effort toward reconciliation rather than just settling for accusation and violence? What does it mean in our collective life to bear witness to a new kind of peace and a new way to imagine our conflict rather than simply resorting to a violence which then we mythologize and call sacred? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ and this love that endures forever. Certainly we can resist it, but how long can we resist the divine love which endures forever? This is the question of Lent, and we reflect on it this week. Amen. And now that we've considered our gospel, we take a moment to declare our faith. This is the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now that we've declared our faith, we offer our prayers. And these are the prayers of the people. Join me now in the prayers of the people. This week, Lord, we pray together for a fire within us, stirring the courage of prophets. We pray for the leaders in our church who are facing difficult decisions. Bless their conversations, nudge them with your wisdom, and give them the courage to navigate the days ahead. We pray for our ties as a church community to be strengthened. Bind us together in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for an end to the wars raging around the world. We ask that you infuse all of the leaders, diplomats, and negotiators working toward peace with your superhuman strength and courage. We especially pray for victims of violence and injustice, those who are mourning, who have been displaced, who are wrongfully imprisoned, who feel like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Comfort them and walk with them in these dark days so they may find hope in your unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our siblings who are suffering. Give them the courage to seek your peace and to trust that no struggle is too big or deep or hopeless for you to handle. We ask for wisdom, Lord, for the courage to see when our lives feel dark. As we encounter challenges, help us stay focused on you and live in the light that you so graciously shine upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on those who have passed, Lord, and give peace to those who are preparing to meet you. We lift up our friends who have lost loved ones, who are lonely, heartbroken, searching for answers. There is much that we don't understand, God, but we seek to trust you and your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now having prayed our prayers, we make space for confession. Would you join me in holy memory considering the week behind us, the ways that we've fallen short of love, and ask for God's help to hone in on a memory that matters. And remember, it's God's kindness that leads to change. So if there's any image of God right now that keeps you from soberly looking at your life, simply discard it with every exhale. And with every inhale, receive afresh the tender mercy of Jesus Christ. Friends, know that you're not alone. Whatever memory is coming to the surface of your mind right now, they come to all of us. And so right now, I invite you into this ancient and corporate confession. Would you join me in this? Most merciful God, we confess that we've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We're truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we would delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now, friends, hear the good news, that as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love toward you, and as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. You're loved and you're included and you're forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we come to this table, again, this table which tells us there is no distinction, that there is neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, Republican or Democrat, gay or straight, black or white, all the distinctions that we create. Jesus obliterates 
through his mercy and love and inclusion. And so we come to this table and we ask God to grace us once again. And we begin with gratitude. So would you join me in this ancient prayer? The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. God, it is good and beautiful to say thank you. And right now, we hear our own hearts and voices lifting up with the angels and archangels of Isaiah's vision, who say, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and cup and he blessed them. After he took the bread, he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this body, which is broken and given. May we be broken and given for our world. Amen. Likewise, Jesus took the cup and after he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance, remembrance of me. And so we welcome you, risen Christ. We thank you for this cup, which points us to the way of forgiveness and reconciliation and truth. Amen. And now, friends, we declare the mystery of faith. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. And these are God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. Amen. And now, friends, we invite you to receive Holy Communion. Our practice is an open table. Any drawn to the love we see in Christ are welcome to come. Let this be a gesture of your open heart to receive the love that you find there. And our practice is typically to take the bread and dip it in the cup. Let us receive Holy Communion together. Amen. Thank you for joining us once again at Good Shepherd New York. Uh, we invite you to like and subscribe this, to this YouTube channel. Uh, it helps push this content to people who would be interested in it. And we always have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people watching. And sometimes we only have, I don't know, like 10 to 15 likes, which honestly I could care less about from an ego perspective, but um, our team of creatives and people who do social media are like, you should strongly suggest that people subscribe and like so that it gets out to people who need the content. And so we do this. Um, we also want to give you an update on the uh, uh, Lenten invitation as it pertains to our fundraising efforts. Um, as you know, uh, the My Good Shepherd invitation has uh, two financial asks in light of the transition that we face as a community. Uh, first, there's a capital goal of $300,000 that helps to build our capacity for this transition. And then there is the uh, monthly subscriber goal, which we're calling our My Good Shepherd community, which we're inviting you to participate in. Um, the capital goal is to the My Good Shepherd Fund, and it is uh, exclusively set apart for the transition to a new home and to secure a long-term lease and the work required to secure that. The uh, monthly subscriber goal is around our normal operating budget and that sort of visibility that we can get into the future as we try to be good stewards of our spending. Um, it gives us that uh, stability and it gives us that security. Um, so I uh, want to give you some updates uh, in the capital goal, uh, which is uh, currently $300,000. Uh, we are now at $42,000, and I think 42320 to be specific. And uh, so already in uh, a couple of weeks, we've made good progress. And uh, one of the things that we're excited about as we continue to explore new options, uh, we have some exciting things that are in the works, and we will hopefully be able to be more concrete with uh, what is possible with this capital goal being met, and also perhaps uh, other things that are possible should we exceed that goal. Um, so if you can help us uh, build, those, uh, build, build toward that goal, um, truly the sooner the better. 
uh, so that we can begin to act uh, as uh, our timeline is significant and some of the things that need to take place for us to make this transition need to happen sooner than later. And we look forward to sharing updates as we're able. Um, the second goal is to get to 250 monthly subscribers, uh, which is our Good Shepherd community. And uh, we have remained flat this week in that area, still at 221. Uh, we have had some people join, but we also had some people drop, and so we're continuing to be at 221. Uh, and so we invite you, if you're not already giving in a recurring way uh, to our tithes fund, um, you can do that by texting Good Shepherd NY to 77977, uh, or you can also, if you're already part of that community, go in and consider increasing your gift to increase our financial stability year over year. Um, we rarely talk about giving in our community. Uh, we only really talk about it when, when it's truly needed. And that's for things like funding Digital Church. And now it's for this challenge that lies ahead of facing a transition and finding a new home. And so we trust that you will respond in the ways that you can uh, with sacrificial love and joy, and that you'll be able to see and find meaning in your contribution to the beautiful future uh, that we're trying to build as a community. Um, so thank you for your participation, for everybody who's given, and uh, that is all that we're asking for is 100% participation. And we hope that you'll be able to join us on this journey, and we look forward to the updates coming ahead. And now, with that, receive this benediction. Feel the love of God growing within your heart. Go into God's world, planting seeds of love, mercy, joy, and peace in all that you say and do. Be at peace and serve God. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Times despair creeps in again For the age I'm living in And now I awake at night In fear and wonder all my life So I rise and walk the path To where the foxes left their tracks And the water shines like glass Cradled in the mountain pass Somewhere behind the autumn sky The stars are waiting with their light To let me know I'm not alone Guide me on the journey home For here the seasons carry on The flower turns to face the sun And though its moments may be brief Not a one is lost in grief Not a moment's lost in grief When despair creeps in again For the age I'm living in I'll go and seek this wild peace and For a moment I am free And 
In this moment I am free For a moment I am free